Good morning. Welcome to worship with the community of Westside Unitarian Universalist Church, where compassion leads us to work for justice and equality. I'm glad you're joining us for our virtual service today. It is my hope that this gathering will renew your sense of community and connection and nourish your heart, mind, and spirit. My name is Spencer Maxwell, and I'm the worship associate this morning. Reverend Sherry Woodbury will be back live next Sunday, and today's reflection will be delivered by Reverend Beth Dana of First Unitarian Church of Dallas. I'm so glad we can stay connected during these times. Of course, remote worship is not ideal, but it gives us the opportunity to come together as a community each week. West Side is not about the place, it's about the people. We know a pre-recorded worship service would be more polished, but this live worship allows us to close, more closely connect with one another. Thank you to our technology helpers today, including Caroline Nixon, Ken Lising, and Nikki Kennedy. We'll have the pleasure this morning to hear from members of our congregation virtually lead our hymns, including Barbara Crotty, Trisha Bowes, Diane Jones, and Charlie Ford. Thanks also to our wonderful pianist, Yuki Kamamoto, for providing music. Be you a spiritual speaker, an atheist or a theist, whether you find inspiration in the great books or the great outdoors or great conversations, all are welcome in our inclusive congregation. To longtime members and first time visitors alike, I say to all, welcome. Today's order of service is a PDF. A link was provided via the email forward and it will be posted in the chat for you to download. You can also stick around after our service ends today if you would like to join us for our virtual coffee hour. We'll be putting people into breakout rooms of about four people each so you can connect with one another. First, I invite you to consider what helps you to be present for this worship service. Please make yourself comfortable wherever you are this morning. Now, let us worship together as we listen to this morning's prelude. have a chalice where you are, I invite you to gather it and your matches or lighters so that we can all light together after the opening words. I would also like to invite my son, Walker Maxwell, who's watching in the next room, to come join me and light our chalice at a moment. Our opening words this morning are from Luis A. Robeck. We come to this hour knowing that it is but an hour. Yet out of all the hours in the week, this is the one that is set apart, an hour that is saved, an hour that is savored. It is a time for us to come to recognize what gives life meaning. It is a time to honor what we value. It is a time to celebrate our lives. Let us then celebrate, honor, and recognize that we might fully savor this hour we have saved. Sure. 
try again. The flaming chalice is a symbol of both the heritage of our past and the light of hope within this church today. Lighting it is a reminder of the resilience and strength of this congregation. Our chalice song this morning is Gathered Here. Words are in the order of service and presented here on the screen. Live service, folks. Thanks very much. From your home, I invite you to sit tall or stand and join me in reciting the affirmation printed in the order of service and on the screen. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation, thus do we covenant with one another. Please join in singing our opening hymn, We Sing Now Together. Words are in the order of service and presented on the screen.
Time for All Ages will be presented to get today again by Nikki Kennedy. She'll ask us to think about where we feel safe and to consider the stories of people around us. Good morning, West Side. It's good to see you. I wanted to ask you a question this morning. First thing, I want you to think about a place where you feel safe, a place where you feel secure and comfortable. Maybe you need to think a minute. Maybe you need to close your eyes. Maybe it's something that you can hold on to that helps keep you feeling safe. Maybe it's a pillow pet like mine, or maybe it's a certain place you like to lay your head or curl up with. Mine is my pillow. It's this pillowcase in particular I love to tie-dye. When I was growing up, it wasn't really so much what I had with me as it was who was around me. I had a great family. I had parents and aunts and uncles. I had a church family. They all equipped me and encouraged me and let me feel safe because they welcomed and accepted me just as I was. I had people around me that made sure I knew stories. I knew the stories of who they were, of where they came from. I knew the stories of my community, the good decisions and the decisions that should have been much better. I had teachers in my life. I had these amazing adults that made sure that I knew stories, the stories of where we had come from. And that's what I wanna encourage in you today. Do you know the stories of where you've come from, where your families have come from, where your community has been, where it is today? Are we gonna repeat ourselves? Are we gonna continue to learn? Westside is a community that intentionally welcomes all people. It's a place where we want all to come and feel welcome, to feel at peace. So as we're in this weird and unusual time, I encourage you, to think about ways that you can help others feel safe, that you can help others feel at peace, and to learn your stories. Thank you, Nikki. We appreciate everything you do for our church community. We have several joys and concerns shared this morning that were emailed to our pastoral care team. You can also post your uh, joys and concerns and comments right now if you'd like to share them with all today. Just remember that because we are live streaming and we'll post this recording, anything you share today could be heard by many. As we share our joys and concerns, those joys are multiplied. As we share our joys with others, those joys are multiplied. As we share our concerns, our community can offer its care. We have two joys and one concern that were emailed to the pastoral care team. We'll start with joys uh, from Diane Jones. She expresses her heartfelt gratitude to the Westside family for the sympathy cards, texts, phone calls, and even charitable donations in her dad's honor. Your love and caring truly lifted her spirits. Thank you, Diane. We're all thinking about you still. From Kelly Flanagan, she says, I received a wonderful surprise in the mail this week. Andre's mom, Rachel, sent me the most precious finger painting masterpiece to brighten my day. It is proudly displayed on my refrigerator in a place of honor. Thank you, Andre and Rachel, for remembering me during this difficult time. I teared up with joy. You all made my week. Thanks for that, Kelly. And one concern that has been submitted, Karen Moore's friend that she met through Mom's Demand Action for Gun Sense lost her stepdaughter to a murder-suicide on May 10th. Her friend was very active in the group Block Walking for Gun Sense at candidates and protesting NRA events. In spite of their advocacy, her friends are now sadly gun violence survivors. Thoughts, prayers, or meditations would be most appreciated for our friend and her husband. We're so sorry to hear that, Karen. Thank you for sharing the joys and concerns with us. Sharing draws our community closer together. Please know that our pastoral care associates are also available to support you one-on-one -on -one with the ups and downs that life brings. When you want to connect, you can reach out directly to any of them by sending an email to pastoralcare at westsideuu.org or call the church and you'll be connected. 
We also have an inReach fund administered by the pastoral care, pastoral care team that can help members and friends through a time of short-term financial need. We're here for you. This morning's centering song is Spirit of Life. you to join me in a time of centering. Each week here at Westside, we open our hearts to those in our community who know both joys and challenges and to all suffering beings. I'll offer an introduction before we move into a time for silent introspection. You may wish to position yourself comfortably and let your eyes rest. Call into our circle of care. Anyone you would like to call into our circle of care, you can enter into the chat. I want to mention Martin's third birthday. I mentioned I, mi I missed that during the joys and concerns. Happy birthday, Martin. Can't believe he's already three years old. We're also remembering uh, members who have lost loved ones and are mourning their losses. We're celebrating the art from the youngest of our community. We're remembering those who are no longer with us that we think about every day. Let us enter into a period of silence marked at the beginning and end by the sound of a bell. During the silence, you may wish to meditate, pray, or just sit silently and allow yourself to slow down. Westside has a long tradition of reaching out to the wider community in generosity. 
because the needs of our church community and the communities around us have shifted during the pandemic and because we've seen a drop in loose plate offerings since we shifted to meeting online, we recently introduced some changes to our offerings. In addition to giving online through our donation webpage or mailing a, church, a check to the church, you can now use the Give Plus app available through the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. Please know that payments on your pledge to support the church itself are needed just as much as ever. While we're not meeting in our building, we are still paying on, on our mortgage and our staff are finding new ways to continue our ministry. Thank you for being as faithful in your pledge as your circumstances allow. We also welcome donations to the church's in-reach fund to be able to respond generously to our members and friends in need. Lastly, if you are able to provide financial support to community organizations helping to meet people's needs during this time, we encourage you to make gifts directly to those organizations. One organization Westside has long supported is Samaritan House. You can give to Samaritan House online at their website or by postal mail. To give you some time to make a gift right now as you're able, we'll hear a gift of music from Yuki. Thank you, Yuki. And thank you for putting into practice here at Westside the spiritual virtue of generosity. Our giving helps to ensure that our mission continues and connects us to the wider web of community. Our guest minister this morning is the Reverend Beth Dana. She's the Minister of Congregational Life at First Unitarian Church of Dallas, where she has served since 2014. She is a lifelong Unitarian Universalist from upstate New York. She moved to Texas, the birthplace of her wife, Erin, in 2012, and now lives in East Dallas with Erin and their two-year-old twins. Our reading and reflection this morning, delivered by Reverend Beth Dana. The Truly Great by Stephen Spender, a British poet who wrote these words in the 1930s. I think continually of those who were truly great, who from the womb remembered the soul's history through corridors of light where the hours are suns, endless and singing, whose lovely ambition was that their lips still touched with fire should tell of the spirit clothed from head to foot in song, and who hoarded from the spring branches the desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget, 
the essential delight of the blood drawn from ageless springs, breaking through rocks in worlds before our earth. Never to deny its pleasure in the morning's simple light, nor its grave evening demand for love. Never to allow gradually the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, see how these names are fetid by the waving grass and by the streamers of white cloud and whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore their hearts, the fire's center, born of the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. In the 1990s, historian David Blight discovered that there was more to the story of Memorial Day than we as a country had known. He happened across the uncatalogued writings of a Union soldier from the Civil War in the Harvard archives. They piqued his interest, so he looked further. What he found was that the first Memorial Day, or Decoration Day as it was called, was marked by African Americans recently freed from slavery in Charleston, South Carolina on May 1st, 1865. The story of that day is quite powerful and poignant. By that date, most white residents had abandoned the city in ruins, but thousands of blacks, including many formerly enslaved, remained. It was the commander of the 21st United States Colored Infantry that accepted the city of Charleston's official surrender. During the final year of the war, the Confederate Army had converted a horse racing club, formerly used by the planter aristocracy, into an outdoor prison. Union prisoners of war were kept in horrible conditions there, and not surprisingly, at least 257 died. They were buried in a mass grave behind the grandstand. When the prison had been abandoned, 28 black men from one of the local churches went to the site and worked for two weeks to rebury the Union dead properly. They laid out the graves in neat rows, cleaned and landscaped the burial ground, put a fence around it, and built an archway over the entrance with the words, Martyrs of the Race Course. At nine o'clock on the morning of May 1st, Nearly 10,000 people gathered to commemorate those who had died. The procession at the racetrack included 3,000 black school children recently enrolled in Freedmen's schools who carried roses and sang freedom songs. Then came 300 black women of the Patriotic Association, which provided clothing and other goods to freed people. Then they, they carried baskets of flowers, wreaths, and crosses to the new burial ground. And these women were followed by the Mutual Aid Society, an association of black men, who were followed by crowds of white and black citizens. There were so many flowers brought to the graves that one newspaper reporter described it as holy mounds. The tops, the sides, and the spaces between the graves were one mass of flowers not a speck of earth could be seen. Once the procession had come to an end, the dedication ceremony began, conducted by all the ministers of the black churches in Charleston. The dedication was followed by dozens of speeches at the grandstand and by picnics around the grounds. The whole event was a ritual of remembrance and consecration, led by freed blacks in cooperation with white missionaries and teachers. The symbolism was powerful. A multiracial group marching on grounds that had formerly belonged to the aristocracy as a place for leisure and display of wealth, which were then turned into a prison camp, were now a site to remember those who died in war, many of them black Americans. As David Blight, the historian, put it, they were announcing to the world with their flowers, their feet, and their songs what the war had been about. The Broadway musical Hamilton, which has broken box office records, is about the time and people around an earlier war in American history, and that moment in our historical memory. In the song, History Has Its Eyes on You, 
George Washington tells Alexander Hamilton what he wished he'd known before going into battle. You have no control who lives, who dies, who tells your story, he sings. These words ring true then and when it comes to the story of those who celebrated the first Decoration Day. It wasn't just who would tell their story that they didn't have control over, but whether their story would be told at all. Three years after Decoration Day at the race course in 1868, Major General John Logan, leader of an organization of Union veterans, established Decoration Day as May 30th. This national holiday would be an annual commemoration of the war dead and a time to decorate their graves with flowers. This, in a formal sense, was the origin of Memorial Day. But there are differing stories about the holiday's origins and many cities that claim to have been the site of the first such commemoration. The events that took place in Charleston on May 1st, 1865, were left out of the national story until recently. Another 48 years passed, and Mrs. S. C. Beckwith, president of the Ladies Memorial Association of Charleston, received a letter from a United Daughters of the Confederacy official in New Orleans, asking if the story she had heard about this ritual in 1865 was true. The Ladies Memorial Associations were founded by wealthy white women in the years after the Civil War to provide burial and raise monuments in memory of Confederate soldiers. Mrs. Beckwith responded, I regret that I was unable to gather any official information in answer to this. So either the story had been lost in collective memory or it had been buried along with the dead. Today, the martyrs of the race course cemetery is no longer there. The Union dead who had been buried there in 1865 were moved to the National Cemetery in Beaufort, South Carolina in the 1880s. The site is currently used as Hampton Park, named after Wade Hampton, who was the governor of South Carolina in the 1870s, a Confederate general, and a supporter of white supremacist organizations at the time. There is, however, still an oval running track, which is used by local residents and cadets from the nearby Citadel. A story about multiracial commemoration in which formerly enslaved Blacks celebrate their emancipation and restore dignity and honor to those who died in war did not fit with the national story at the time. The meaning of Memorial Day is fraught. It is both deeply political and deeply personal in its construction. Blight describes the holiday as a way of both remembering and forgetting and a way to make meaning of all that was lost in the war and what came of it. The Reconstruction period immediately following the Civil War was a time when partisan memory of the war formed. It meant different things depending on whether you were Black or White in the North or the South. Memorial Day was initially associated with the Union side, so the Southern states established their own Confederate Memorial Day. The story people told was a way of coping with their loss or victory in the war. Yet less than a decade later, when Reconstruction ended in the South, if you attended a Memorial Day celebration, you would hear very little talk of slavery or race. It was all about unity. From that day forward, most Memorial Day celebrations sought to forget the schisms that had developed. It became a day of unity, national reconciliation, and coming together in sacred bereavement for those who have died in war. I tell you this story of the origins of Memorial Day not just because the holiday is tomorrow, but because this moment in history, right now, is fractured and divided, both politically and racially. I certainly hope we're not on the verge of another civil war, but we do have to cope with the divisions in our society and reflect on our place in it. One way of doing this is to remember, and to remember well. We have to remember both the discord of the post-Civil War era and the ways people bridged divides, like on May 1st, 1865. We remember these because of what they teach us about today and how they help us understand the world we see around us. Why on Memorial Day do we lay flowers on graves, march and parades, grill and have picnics and play taps in remembrance of those who have died? 
It all started with the freed blacks in Charleston, the children and teachers and ministers and citizens who were committed to properly honoring the war dead. Their act of commemoration was not just about the dead, though. It was also about the living. Why do we engage in rituals of remembrance and commemoration in general? Such rituals, whether personal, familial, or national, help us define ourselves and help communities form identity. Through these rituals, we remember who we are and where we come from, and they are the beginning of shaping our future. Remembering well is a way of placing ourselves in a larger story. The Stephen Spender poem I read, which he wrote post-World War I, talks of the dead as great. One thing that's important to know about the poet is that throughout his life he struggled with feelings of inferiority, starstruck by others' greatness. He yearned for recognition amongst his peers as a schoolboy and then in poetry circles. For him, like for the people in Charleston, remembering well was about self-definition as much as it was about remembering the dead. This is why we engage in rich religious rituals of remembrance, why we celebrate national holidays such as Memorial Day, and why we have memorial services for loved ones who have died. It shapes how we move forward in our lives. This is why grief is especially hard in these times, when we're not able to gather for memorials due to public health restrictions. Whether or not we gather to remember together, we have pieces of history notes, pictures, and more. From our parents, their parents, and their parents, or from those who came before us in our city and nation. I encourage you to spend time with these and see how they help you understand yourself and the world around you. A few years ago in May, right around this time, I took a mini pilgrimage to North Augusta, South Carolina, just over the Savannah River border from Georgia. I spent the weekend at the Convent of St. Helena, home to an Episcopal or an order of Episcopal nuns with Benedictine roots, who are progressive in their theology and feminism, and live a life of prayer, hospitality, and service. I went there because my grandmother's cousin, Cornelia Montgomery Ransom, was part of the order for 45 years. Prior to becoming a nun, she was a math teacher. When she joined the order, she continued teaching math and English in New York and all around the world. She was a spiritual director and a chaplain at Ground Zero after the 9-11 attacks. She was an amazing minister. I visited her at their convent in New York the summer before I started seminary. Later that year, she moved to the convent in the South, but we kept in touch as my ministry unfolded. I looked forward to visiting her again sometime, and she invited me often. But then in 2012, as I was heading to the airport to fly to Boston for my ministerial credentialing interview, the panel that says, yes, go forth and be a minister, I got the news that Sister Cornelia had died. I had been wanting to make the trip to visit the Sisters of St. Helena ever since, and I finally had the chance. It was a time of retreat, and it was a time of remembrance. Just a week or two before my visit, they had relocated the graves of sisters who had died from the old convent in Georgia to the newly constructed one in South Carolina. The stones were laid out in neat rows under the shade of trees, on the edge of a big field visible from the windows of the chapel. Sister Cornelia and those with whom she shared this burial site were still part of the community. In addition to many remembrances the sisters shared with me on my visit, they also brought me to a big storage building, a corner of which housed stacks of dusty boxes. Two of those boxes were Cornelia's. Later in life, she became very interested in family genealogy. One of these boxes held all her research findings, and the other held photo albums and booklets on Parkinson's disease, the cause of her death. These were boxes of documents, family trees, obituaries, records of family burial plots that helped her to understand who she was. And that was one of the reasons I was there, to remember well, 
to understand part of where I come from, a religious leader and family member who influenced me. I think there is a human spiritual need for remembrance and consecration. So we don't forget where we come from. So we don't forget the sacrifice and loss it has taken to get where we are today. And so we don't forget our history, personal and collective. We have a need to remember well so that we can learn from the past, repeat what deserves to be repeated, or do otherwise. <coughs> this is why rather than letting the ritual of Decoration Day live in the past, with the people who laid the war dead to rest and marched in Charleston in 1865, we remember year after year. As the historian who rediscovered this event wrote, some stories endure, some disappear, some are rediscovered in dusty archives, the pages of old newspapers and in oral history. All such stories as the first decoration day are but prelude to future reckonings. All memory is prelude. The legacy of the Civil War and of those who celebrated the first Memorial Day still lives with us. As a country, we've been through Reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights, and are now in what's being called the new Jim Crow era. This is an era not of slavery on cotton plantations, but of mass incarceration and widespread racial and economic inequality. This inequality is laid bare again and again, most recently by the coronavirus, which has taken its toll more heavily in communities of color and impoverished communities. We live in an era in which we have to proclaim that black lives matter because they're not always treated as such. On Memorial Day, or any day, what will we do with its origin story? What will we do with our own memories of the past and of people we have lost? Let us go to the burial sites of those who have died, both loved ones and strangers, with the spirit of the freed slaves in mind to memorialize the dead, not to blame those who killed them, not to paint a glorious rosy picture of the honorable and perhaps horrific acts of the warriors, but to grieve the circumstances and the system of which their death was an unfortunate casualty. Some may visit the graves of soldiers who died in Iraq and Afghanistan, glorifying the United States and vilifying Muslims. Some may visit the graves of black Americans killed on our streets, glorifying the dead and vilifying the killers. As much as we try to forget the division that brought about the first Memorial Day, we relive it again and again in our memorializing. Instead, let us go to these places for sacred bereavement, as the people did in 1865 remembering the conflict that led to death, while also holding up the vision and practice of unity. We are part of a religious community of memory and hope. Let us remember well, find hope in these memories for a better future. As we look back at our own lives, the lives of our loved ones and our nation, we will learn things about ourselves that will serve us well. On this Memorial Day, may we honor in our minds, hearts, and actions the memory of those before us who left the vivid air signed with their honor. Let us do justice and love mercy in their name and be a blessing for those to come. All memory is prelude. Let us remember well. Amen and blessed be. Thank you to Reverend Dana for those words today. That was a great message for this Memorial Day weekend. Now I invite you to stand or sit tall and join in singing our closing hymn, Do You Hear?
Our closing words are from Steve J. Crump. That which is worthy of doing, create with your hands. That which is worthy of repeating, speak with a clear voice. That which is worthy of remembering, hold in your hearts. And that which is worthy of living, go and live it now. Please join in the congregational closing projected on the screen. Let us go in peace, believe in peace, and create peace in our lives and in the world. May it be so. If you'd like to participate in our virtual coffee hour, please stay on the call and you'll be placed into a breakout room with several other people. Please be mindful of our congregational covenant, welcome newcomers, and give everyone an equal chance to participate in conversation. Once everyone is in groups, we'll post some discussion starter questions in the chat for you. Coffee hour will continue until 1140 when the call will end. As always, we welcome your feedback about our time together online. Go in peace.